Today I want to talk about some recent work I've done looking at fluctuations in tension during goal directed action. So I'll keep the background relatively brief since I'm going to have a lot of overlap with what Jim Dunn was talking about. But of course, I think most people would agree that goal directed action is a very fundamental component of human behavior. And we learn it at a pretty young age, and it's something that we really work towards, but also it can be pretty frustrating because sometimes <laughs> our motor output doesn't necessarily match our goals, by which I mean there's a lot of variability. So you can have the same goals, you can even have relatively similar input, and yet you can have a lot of variation in performance, a lot of variation in motor output for the goals that you're trying to accomplish. And of course, with the dartboard, the con that's kind of the point of the game, but there can also be really serious consequences. So the classic examples are things like driving, where a slight change in how quickly you push the brake or a slight change in how you're steering the wheel can actually have really big consequences. Or imagine, say, a surgeon who's trying to make really precise movements with really high stakes. Even slight variation in motor output could have big consequences. One personal example I have is trying to cut a butternut squash, which I did once in grad school and ended up in urgent care. So in all of these cases, you can have a lot of variation in what seems like a relatively simple goal. So the question that I'm thinking about with this, with the work I'm going to talk about today, is why do these action outcomes vary when goals remain consistent? And that's, of course, a pretty broad question. I'm sure a lot of people even in these talks today and tomorrow are sort of addressing this question in various ways. And I'm going to focus mostly on just one framework that I tend to use which is thinking of things in terms of distraction. <laughs> and part of the reason I do this is I come from a lot of grad school where this is something I study not in the context of action. So I started thinking about the question of distractions and how we can incorporate that into understanding this variation in motor output. So to do that, you know, like any good college professor, I wanted to think about how to define distraction. So I looked it up on Wikipedia. <laughs> and it's a pretty decent little uh, description here. It's a lack of interest in the object of intention or the great intensity, novelty, or attractiveness of something other than the object. Of attention. And they break it down into these, this, this, these two forms of distraction, basically. Well, if external and internal distraction contribute to the interference of focus, of course, if you're going to say media, you can also So I, I say this kind of jokingly, but I actually do really like that framework. And of course, there's lots of people who have used this external versus internal distraction framework. And that's the kind of framework I'm going to use today. So when I talk about external distraction, I mostly mean when attention is captured by a task irrelevant object. And in today's case, I'm going to focus on when that happens because of physical properties, but there are other reasons that objects that are not what your current target is can capture your attention. And when I talk about internal distractions, I, talk, I want to talk about attention being captured by internal thoughts, things like, what am I going to have for dinner tonight, things that are not part of the external environment, but rather akin to something like mind wandering. So I'll start with external distractions. So again, I won't get into the background too much, but the basic idea is that there are objects in the world that stand out because of their physical properties. And in many cases, this is fine. In fact, sometimes we take advantage of this if we want to make a fire alarm or a warning sign that grabs people's attention. But there can be cases where they're negative. So one of the examples I like is these roadside billboards, which sometimes change. And this isn't just a hypothetical thing. I don't know if you guys have seen these. I actually ran into one on the way to the airport on this trip. Right? And so this is the kind of transient change that can really stand out, which again, if you capture attention while you're on the road, even a couple hundred milliseconds of attention away from the road could have disastrous consequences in certain cases. So the standard paradigm, which Juhan has already talked about to study intentional capture, I shouldn't say the standard, one standard, or one very common paradigm developed right here in the Netherlands by Jan Kewas maybe 25 or so years ago, is this additional singleton paradigm, where you ask participants to find a particular target, a unique shape target, and in some trials, you make one of the non-unique shapes differently colored. And the typical result, if you look at something like a key press, is that response time will be longer on the trials when one of those salient distractors is present. The idea being that these salient distractors can grab attention. And of course, you kind of talk about this work that we did using this paradigm of reaching, where we do find this sort of consistent pull on the hands as well. And I want to give credit. There's other people who've done very similar work, including some of the people in this room, on similar ideas about the ways in which salient objects can actually impact something like moving objectives. But the work I want to talk to you about now is a little bit different. So we took the same paradigm with a collaborator of mine. And we started looking at behavior in younger children. It's one of the cool things about this technique, this technique that I'm going to use today is the same that Jihan was talking about in the studies um, that she talked about a few minutes ago, is that it's a lot easier to tell a kid to point to the diamond, a five-year-old, let's say, than it is to ask them to report the orientation of a line inside a unique shape. I actually have trouble with my undergrads with that particular instruction. So the idea is, can we get kids to do this task? And if we can, what kind of developmental trajectory would we see for something like the presence of salient object. So here's a quick video just to 
we go there and find a unique shape. Now, what happens if we put a distractor? Tell me which one's different. Are you distracted by the koala bear? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. She, she's gotten a lot better at, at you know at, at her vocal recognition. She's really good now at acquiring the things that she really wants. You know, where snacks are possible for her. Right now. Okay. So, but that's it, what we really want to do is to try this with kids, not quite that young, but with kids pretty young, and see what happens. This is actually the exact same picture Jihan had. So this is the setup. Jihan's lab, but in my lab now, I have a very similar setup to track hand movements with this um, this electromagnetic sensor. And on a typical trial, we would ask a subject to reach out and point to the target. And we could break down the, that response in a couple different ways. So we can look at initiation latency, which we just defined as how long between stimulus onset and when the hand starts moving. We can look at movement time. How long does it take to actually get there once you start moving? And we can also look, of course, at the path of the movement, the movement trajectory. And there's lots of different ways that you can break down trajectory answers. You know, we've heard some already. We'll probably hear other different ones. The one I'm going to focus mostly on is what we just call curvature. And all that really means is the maximum point of deviation in the path of a movement from a line connecting the beginning and end of the movement. So something like this here. It's the ratio of those two things that we, we refer to as curvature. So I should give credit here. This work is also work I've done in collaboration with Chris Erb, um, who was who you kind of talked about his work a little bit as well, who is, uh, has more of a developmental background. So he's the one who knows about working with kids. So the first thing we did is we, we presented this task, just like the ones you can describe, where it's half the time a distractor is present, half the time a distractor is absent. And we'll start with initiation latency. So how long does it take people to start moving? If you combine all the data, you don't see any differences. But in general, the presence of the distractor doesn't change how quickly people start their movement. And if you break it down by age, what you see is that there's a very clear main effect of age. Five-year-olds take a lot longer to start moving than adults, almost twice as long in this task. But there's actually no effect of distractors. It's remarkably flat across all these age groups that you're seeing basically that the presence of a distractor has no impact on how quickly people start moving. But the next thing that we want to look at is the curvature. We want to look at the path of movement that people have. So again, if you look overall, now it seems like there is an effect of a distractor being present. There is a pull on hand movements. But if you look at the developmental trajectory, what you see is a much bigger effect than the younger kids, and an effect that fades with time as you get older. Now, you'll notice that error bar for five-year-olds is particularly large, and you can have a question about how much kind of trimming of the data you want to do in cases like this, because there are these trials where five-year-olds like way over here and then end up at the target. So you can kind of split that up either way, but even if you do remove outliers using something like kind of a standard iterative trimming procedure, what you'll see is that there's still a significant effect of distractor presence for five and nine-year-olds that pretty much fades as people get older. So you're seeing this developmental trajectory for these effects where in younger children, salient distractors have a profound impact on the path of the movement, but not so much how quickly you start. As you get older, those effects go away. Now, I should mention that there are task-specific things, so I don't want to make any broad claims about what salient distractors do for this one task. For example, here, there's not much of an effect of curvature in adults. Part of that is because the target shape was kept consistent to keep the task easy for kids. So there are ways in which you can get bigger effects or smaller effects and things like that. This is just sort of a first step in the process. So in addition to these salient effects, we wanted to look at something else. Um, because in this task, you get sequences of trials. So just here's a sample sequence where you ask the kid to point to the diamond, point to the next diamond, point to the diamond on this trial. So this would just be a sample sequence of four trials where they would point each time. And what, what's interesting here is that this third trial involves a target location repetition. So you'll notice the target was in the upper right on the last trial, it's in the upper right again. So you have this recent um, repetition that might lead to something like priming, right? Jihyun and, and Ken Akiyama, people have done this work on priming a pop-out, potentially a similar kind of thing where you might expect a target repetition to have an effect. So again, we broke down the data, but this time this is a function of whether the target location had repeated or switched from the previous trial. And if you look overall, there's not really much of a difference. And if you break it down by age, what you see is just for the five-year-olds, there is a significant effect. So for five-year-olds, they're starting their movement quite a bit faster when the target location repeats as opposed to when it doesn't. Now, I'm not going to show the curvature data, but the curvature effects aren't really there. So it's not, it's not as though there's, there's things happening later in the movement path. What's happening with location repetition effects is they appear to be influencing something different. They're influencing something earlier. Now, both of these effects are not task relevant. So people going into this task know that salient distractors aren't relevant. The color is not a relevant part of this task. And similarly, target location is not relevant, at least in the context of this task, 
because target location is random. So there's no reason to adopt a strategy of assuming that there is going to be repetition if they only happen as often as you would expect them to happen by chance. So the takeaway here is that you have these external salient distractors that disrupt hand movements, and that younger children are more adversely affected in terms of trajectory. They have this bigger curvature of the salient distractor. But target location rep repetitions also affect younger children in initiation latency. So these two properties are affecting different components of motor output. Now here's the part where I wish I could say something really you know, profound about what that means. And the truth is, I don't know what that means. I think it's interesting that these two properties have effects of different parts of movement. And I'm you know, tempted to say something like, well, the salient distractor maybe affects a later stage of processing, which could be true. But there's probably planning of those movement paths that's occurring much before the movement starts. So I don't know yet what to say about those differences. I can say that Chris has done some work with cognitive control as well, where he also finds different aspects of cognitive control paths, different kind of inner trial contingencies affect different parts of the movement in similar ways. I think we're still very much working on this. I'm curious to hear people's thoughts later if they do have particular thoughts about that. But I do think it's interesting that you get these different components with these two different measures. Um, OK, so I didn't want to linger too long on external distractions, because we had talked about that a lot as well. So I want to spend the rest of the time talking about internal distractions. And part of the reason I've gotten interested in this idea of internal distractions is because the last few years, I've worked at primarily undergraduate institutions. And when I talk to students about what I do, I mention the word distraction. And in the past, that meant typically that I was working with you know, salient objects or objects out in the world that are distracting. But almost every student I talk to when I mention distraction, the first thing they think of is something like mind wandering. They want to know why they can't focus and lecture when they want to, or why when they sit down to write a paper, they find it hard, or why they spend so much time on their phones when they know that they shouldn't, right? Things like this. And so that's really got me interested in, in maybe connecting these two worlds a bit and starting to explore this idea of internal distraction or mind wandering or something like that. And of course, there's a long history of studying these kinds of tasks that involve more sustained attention. So you can think of like an air traffic controller who has to maintain focus on, on a difficult set of stimuli for a long time, or a security guard. There's lots of things in the real world that involve this kind of sustained attention. Um, sort of like Paul was saying earlier, that rather than sort of just stimulus and response, that there's actually continuous behavior in a lot of the things that we do. And this could be an example where you're thinking about sustaining attention over a period of time. And there's lots of vigilance research that goes back many, many years to thinking about you know, asking participants to, to stay focused on a task over a long period of time and maybe respond to stimuli that only occasionally appear. In more recent years, there's been this uptick in the study of something like mind wandering, which is very difficult to measure. Right? Approaches vary from, from simply asking people. You give them probes in the middle to say, hey, are you mind wandering right now? Or you give them questionnaires afterwards to say how frequently were you thinking about things that were unrelated to the task. There's some work that I've, I've really been interested in that I'm going to mostly sort of adopt and I'll tell you about a little later that looks more at response variability. So can you find periods of time when people are more locked in and responding consistently versus periods where their responses are more varied? So getting back to this image from earlier, right? This is the image of the average trajectories across many, 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 many trials. But like Craig was saying, when you actually break down individual trajectories, what you see is far messier. So what I did from this task is I just took one sample participant and plotted all the trials where they reached the lower right and there's a distractor in the upper left. And I swear I didn't cherry pick this. This is like the first one that I plotted. And what you can see is that, that you get these nice pretty averages, but the individual trial level, there's a whole lot of stuff going on. So you get some trials where participants are pulled way off in the direction of the distractor. And you get other trials where they're not really pulled at all, and if anything, they're actually moving a bit in the opposite direction away from this. So I want to start breaking things down more at the individual trial level. So when I talk about internal distractions, by the way, I should say up front, for this next set of data I'm going to talk about, I'm only making sort of an indirect connection to internal distractions. Like I said, it's difficult to measure. So when I say that for now, what I just mean is looking at fluctuations over time and seeing if we can find meaningful patterns there. So earlier I mentioned this measure that we use for curvature. And one kind of neat thing, if you have trials with these salient distractors, is that you can assign a sign to this curvature in the sense that on this trial, the point of peak deviation is closer to the location of the salient distractor than the line connecting the beginning and ends of the movement. Because you can also have trials where the opposite occurs, where you have participants move in the opposite direction away from the distractor. And here the magnitude of this curvature measure is about the same, but here we could give it the opposite sign. We 
state, it actually, because the hand is moving away from the distractor, we're going to consider that a little bit something different. So the question then is, are these fluctuations that we're seeing meaningful or are they completely random? And maybe that sounds a little bit like a straw man, but there are certainly any kind of behavior that you have, you're going to have some variability. If we just ask people to do the simplest task in the world, just point to a square on a screen, you won't get literally the exact same movement every time. So there's always going to be some variance. There's variability even in the measurement tool that we use. But can we find patterns within these fluctuations that are actually meaningful in some way? So to do that, we looked at sequence effects. And we want to start with this idea of what's called negative position finding. What I mean by that is imagine on the previous trial, trial N minus one, there's a salient distractor present. And then on the current trial, now there's a target at that same location. We'll call that a match trial. So hopefully that makes sense to everybody, but stop if anything about this is confusing because now I'm getting into sequence effects with drugs. Alternatively, you could have a non-match trial. So you had a salient distractor. Now at that location, there's just one of the other non-targets. The target is actually somewhere else. We'll call those non-match trials. So there's some behavioral evidence that if you have a match trial, it's a little bit harder with a key press tag. You just had a distractor, you tag, you have some kind of inhibitory tag at that location. You have to overcome that now to select a target at that location. That might be a little bit of a problem. We looked at this and we uh, measured, so actually used a slightly different measure. We measured the initial trajectory angle, which is the same idea as curvature, just 20% of the, of the movement. Um, as a function of whether there was a match or a non match. And I can talk more about why we use that measure later if people want, but for now I'm just going to go through it so I can compress the data. And what we found here is that on match trials, there's some curvature, not surprisingly, right, that you're, you're not going directly to the target. But then on non match trials, there is as well. And numerically, it's in the direction, the effect is in the direction you might expect, but it's not significant. So, okay, maybe we're underpowered, you know, maybe this effect isn't all that robust. We're not seeing evidence of that negative position time. But like I said earlier, there's a lot of variation from trial to trial in terms of how much the distractor disrupts the hand. So what we wanted to do next is actually separate out trial n minus one in two different ways. We wanted to look at the trials where the hand moves towards the distractor. We call these prior attraction trials. And then we wanted to look at trials where the hand moves away from the distractor. So we call these prior repulsion trials. So you basically just categorize, categorize trial n minus one as a function of whether the hand moves towards the target or whether the hand moves Away from the target. And then you have the same thing on trial N. Does the location of the distractor on the previous trial match or not match the location of the target in the current trial on the attraction ones and on the repulsion ones? So any graphs I show you are looking at performance on trial N, but they're sorted according to what happened on trial N minus one, both in terms of the match of the location and also whether there was a repulsion or attraction. So I'm not going to go through each individual case. I just want to focus on the most, what I think are the most interesting cases here of prior attraction and repulsion. So the argument would be that on a prior attraction trial, you haven't sort of as successfully inhibited the distractor because you ended up making a motor movement towards it, at least to start out. So in a sense, what you might have done is actually prioritize that location a little bit. Now, obviously, you managed to disengage from it because you ultimately reached your target. But there might be some lingering prioritization of that location, meaning that on trial N, you might be not so bad at that particular location. Whereas on those prior repulsion trials, the idea is that you've pretty successfully inhibited that location, right? You've moved away from it, suggesting that maybe that salient distractor captured attention, or maybe it just created, like Steve Luck talks about this, attend to me signal. There's, there's lots of different ways you can think about it, but something happened at that location and you moved away from it, meaning that now, if you have to reach to that location, that might be hard. You might have this lingering inhibition that makes it harder to select something at that location. Okay, so it's like four o'clock. I just went through this two by two design. So I just want to bring everybody back. Here's some more pictures of the girls. Or if that doesn't do it for you, here's a pile of puppies. All right, we're all back on task. Okay. So just to go through some of these predictions. Okay. So one last time, in the match case, if you had a prior repulsion, what that means is you moved away from that location. So now we think that it's going to be really hard to now reach over there. And indeed, there is a pretty good amount of deviation on those trials. Whereas in the attraction case, we think it might not be quite as hard to move to that location because you already almost did it, right? You were just pulled there recently. Maybe there's still some lingering activation and that's exactly what we see and it's a pretty big difference. Now in the non-match case, that flips and there are potentially interesting reasons for that and I can talk about at least what our interpretation of it is, but I don't want to get, again, too into the details so I can talk about some other stuff. The main idea here is that these negative design position priming effects seem to be contingent on distractor interference at the single trial level. They only happen 
if you had interference, or, or rather, it, you only get that, that priming effect if you inhibited this structure on the previous problem, which happens sometimes, but not all the time. So if you average everything together, maybe in some cases it's going to come out looking like an overall effect. But if you break it down at the individual trial level, it might only be happening some of the time. And by the way, I forgot to mention this is work with Jukan and also with Brian Anderson, who's on us with the reward stuff as well. So one concern that we had is whether the display configuration is causing some of these effects. Because you know, there's kind of weird things about this display where you're going to get more repulsions in certain configurations than others. So we just tilted everything 45 degrees, and we only focused on those cases where there's a target at the top. So it's a relatively unambiguous interpretation to say the bend was towards the distractor in this case, and the bend was away from the distractor in this case. And after doing that, we looked at the same analysis and we found the same effect. So you still get this nice big difference between the prior emotion and the prior attractions, which flips when the target no longer matches the distractor location in the previous trial. So in terms of interpreting these data, um, one interpretation, which is the interpretation I've been going with, is that inhibition of the distractor carries over. And admittedly, I'm biased to think this way. Some of the previous research that you said was about inhibition in the kind of question. Um, but another interpretation is maybe less interesting, or at least it's certainly different, which could be that if your hand bends to the right on one trial, it might bend a little bit on to the right on the next trial, too. So it's not simple motor priming in the sense that these sequences never involve reaching to the same place twice in a row. But you could interpret these data as well. If you were pulled this way before, you might just be a little bit pulled this way when you move over to another direction as well. So one possible solution to disentangling those two explanations is to alternate responses between a reach and a key press. This is something Julian and I had done a few years ago where we cued people on each trial whether they were going to point to a target or whether they were going to press a key in response to the target. So here's what the task looks like. You get a hand cue, you point to the target. You get a keyboard cue, you press a key to indicate the orientation of the line inside the target. And like Julian mentioned, we, we use that task because it involves focal attention in the same way that pointing to a target in this task does. And we do things to make sure that the participants are doing what they're supposed to be doing. So on hand trials, they can't touch a key, and on this next one, the keyboard trial, but I'm going to move my hand a little bit, and then they get a warning when that trial gets thrown out. So we're making sure that they're just using one of these at a time. So again, these are the effects from before. These are the reaching data that I showed you with Sarah, too. The predictions for the key press responses should be about the same. So just to clarify here, what we're looking at is key press response time in the next graph as a function of whether you had repulsion on the previous trial or attraction. Because again, the previous trial was reaching. It's just the current trial that involves a key press response. So we'd hope to find the same thing, where if there's a prior repulsion, it should now be harder to select a target at that location. Now, these are relatively new data. So what we see is the pattern that we hope to see, where you get prior repulsion, it's harder to reach, uh, it's harder to respond to a target there, and the effect flips. But these, this interaction is not statistically significant at this point. We're still relatively underpowered. Because we're alternating response uh, the, the trial types, and we're also only looking at those trials where the reach target was at the top. We're looking at relatively few trials per participant. So the pattern is promising, and I can tell you that the error rate data show the same pattern as well, but it's still relatively preliminary. So I don't want to make any strong conclusions yet. If these data hold up, it would suggest, though, that that, that interpretation about attention, about a higher level cognitive explanation about what's going on, would potentially fit these data. And again, just to show you side by side, they seem to match up pretty well. So in terms of implications, in the, in the sort of world of attention researchers, there's a lot of concern about understanding you know, what factors influence where attention goes at any one given time. And there's a long history of talking about top-down effects and bottom-up effects driving attention. And there's this recent argument that's popped up about also including a third category of selection history, which encompasses things like the target lo location repetition effects I talked about, or reward effects, or the position priming effects I was just talking about. And I think what these data, along with some other data, suggest is that attention is biased not just by what you've recently seen, but also by what you've recently done. So potentially, we can get a much more complete picture here by looking at trajectories at the individual trial level to see if you want to understand something about history, don't just ask what people, kind of trial people have looked at, but also ask what do they actually do with that trial? How do they perform on that trial? And there's other instances of that, too. I don't mean to suggest this is the first Thing looking at that, I mean, there's this idea, you know, the idea of post-error slowing goes back maybe 50, 60 years. So I think just we, we can incorporate more of that kind of thing, especially now that we can measure trajectories like this, to get a more complete picture. So the last part I want to talk about, I want to get into internal distractions just a little bit more. So there's lots of factors in that previous task I showed you, like target shape, presence of the distractor, target location, that could all 
be part of what's going on, right? I'm not trying to make any conclusions about what's causing this variation. And a lot of it could be not so much internal distractions, but certain sequences that I'm not really tracking that I, that I don't understand all the way yet. So I wanted to go a new direction and use a simplified task that was really more like a continuous sustained attention task. So I presented subjects with a box in the center of the screen, with a ball on the side, and just asked them to watch the ball as it headed towards the box. And if they think that the ball is going to overlap the box, touch the target as quickly as they can. So on a trial like this, they need to reach out and touch the target. But on some trials, the ball is going to miss the box. And on those cases, they're supposed to withhold the response. So it's basically a go, no-go task. And it's a difficult one. And the ball is going to move relatively continuous. And 90% of the time, it's going to be a go trial. So I, I borrowed this general idea of, of a go-no-go task with mostly go trials from, from Mike Esterman and Jody Gudis, who have been studying, they call it being in the zone and being out of the zone is kind of a similar way of thinking about mind wandering versus being very focused on task. The idea being that if you ask people to make go responses most of the time, you have a lot of data. So you can look for patterns and variability, changes in patterns and responses that might predict when they make a commission error, when they're going to press the, the box when they're not supposed to on those no-go trials. So here's what the task actually looks like. So it's pretty demanding. And people do make a lot of errors on those trials. You'll notice on that one, I started to go and then I held back. And uh, I haven't looked at the data yet in terms of you could potentially look along the, the axis you know, that connects the participant to the display. For example, how far do they travel? What kinds of information does that give you? I haven't necessarily looked into that yet. But there's a lot of different data to look at here. So if you plot just uh, one participant, uh, I'm sorry. If you plot one participant's data, what we're looking at here is initiation latency. And it's actually just the normalized, uh, uh, I should come up with a better label for that. It's the difference between their mean initiation latency for the entire run and their latency on that individual trial. So in other words, if they go way faster or way slower than they normally do, you'll see a high value here. Whereas if they're responding about how they normally do, you see a low value. And if you do this for any given participant, what you end up seeing is periods of relatively low variability where they're kind of locked in and, and responding in about the way they normally do, and periods of high variability where they're either responding much faster or much slower on individual trials. And so the question here is, can we use information about that variability to predict when participants make errors? And again, I don't want to overstate claims about internal distraction, but one way you can interpret it is on those trials where they're showing higher variability that might suggest that they're a little bit less in tune with the task and a little bit more likely to make errors. And these data are very new as well, actually. These data, I, I've mostly been, I collected my last subject in the past week. So I'm, again, interested to hear what people have to say if they have suggestions because I'm just starting to dig in to these data and, and still actually hoping to collect quite a bit more. So what we're looking here is error rate on the current trial. So these are only those no-go trials. We're seeing how often do people make errors as a function of whether their initiation latency on the previous trial was high or low variance relative to the, the general uh, mean response throughout the run. And same thing with movement time. And what we see with initiation latency is when the previous response was unlike their typical response, they make errors about 35% of the time. And if the previous trial was lower variance, that error rate goes down. That's an approaching statistic. If we look at it with movement time, we see an even bigger effect. It does reach statistical significance. And again, still, still sort of ongoing in terms of data collection. So that could change, but these patterns seem to be relatively strong already. So what that's suggesting is this variability that we can see in a movement path can be used to infer something about how likely it is that somebody is going to make an error, perhaps how likely it is that they're not entirely in focus with the task range. So I'm just getting started with this project, but I think there could be a lot of interesting directions to take it. For example, one of the things Jihan and I have worked with a little bit in the past is the idea of motor effort and how that can change these higher level cognitive processes. So you can imagine if the box they had to reach to was much higher, maybe commission errors would go down. Maybe also we would see less variability in some of these measures. We could see the, you know, the, the ways in which people adapt to avoid errors as a function of how costly those errors are. And that's just one potential direction. I'm happy to hear other people's thoughts. So in general, the take home messages here are that external and internal distractions seem to disrupt full directed action. And using this approach uncovers a lot of things that you couldn't. I mean, again, sort of preaching to the choir here, and a lot of people have already said this today. But the data I showed you with kids showing different stages being affected, different stages being affected by these different task properties, or the individual trial curvature data I showed you, is not something you could really see with individual feet rest. 
like the hand movement towards or away from the distractor gets fast if all you ask people to do is press a key, because inhibition can take time too. So this approach can really uncover a lot of what's going on in ways that traditional approaches can't. And these momentary fluctuations in motor output can actually be used to predict future behavior. So I think this has implications both theoretically in the sense that this helps us understand interactions between the motor system and cognition and helps us understand, for example, what factors determine where attention is prioritized. And I also think it might have practical implications if you think about, you know, for example, workplaces where slight motor variations in motor output can cause serious problems, like I've some examples before, you can imagine lots, we might be able to track performance in real time to see instances where people are less focused, especially now given the technology has changed such that tracking behavior in relatively high precision and detail and analyzing the data in real time is, is very feasible. So in theory, we could use this kind of information to try to prevent accidents in cases where motor variability can lead to potentially costly errors. Thank you. This time, so we'll start going around this way. This time, Paul, we didn't start. Oh, me? Okay, yeah. okay. Um, so I that was a really uh, very interesting talk, and I'm, I'm quite so. In, in the last one, you showed a little bit like there's these bouts of better attending and weaker attending. Um, did you see that also in the attraction and repulsion data? Were there times that people tended to get attracted more for a run of the number of trials, or was it more a trial to trial? And if, if there were runs, how long? That's a good question. So in this particular data set, I didn't look at it. Um, you guys have the microphone or should I? Oh. I don't know if I, the question was whether the sort of periods of high variability and low variability also occur in the earlier data set where I was looking at individual trajectories on a trial by trial basis. And I can tell you certainly in previous data sets that those things do run together a little bit. For example, in one, in one previous experiment, we looked at what we call partial errors, which we just defined as a function of how far does the deviation go away from a typical movement? And one, we found in general that those partial errors are, I mean, sometimes we call them change of, changes of mind, depending on how you want to kind of contextualize those things. They do happen in runs. So if you have a high curvature on one trial, you're a little more likely to make a high curvature on the next trial. <clears throat> sometimes that's dependent on some kind of repeated context. So we, uh, we actually, you know, I think even one of our papers talked about it in the, in the context of something like uh, the theory of event coding, the idea being that if you, if you repeat the context, like the colors of the objects on consecutive trials, you might see similar curve trajectories on consecutive trials, whereas if you switch things up, they don't run together as much. But it's a good question, and maybe I'll have to go back into those data and look a little bit more to find a better way to try to describe, like, how you can figure out the length of a run or something like that. Well, if I could just uh, follow up on that. The reason I'm asking is because we recently have been looking at really a different phenomenon, but now I've now I'm wondering whether it's similar. And, and it has to do with speed axis trade-offs, that sometimes you take a guess, sometimes you're more conservative, et cetera. So we've been doing this with monkeys a lot, where monkeys have this task where they can sort of take guess and where they can move longer. And we can notice that there are periods of time um, that fluctuate over the course of the daily sessions where they're a little bit more hasty or a little bit more conservative, a little bit like, a little bit more aroused and ready to go, and a little bit kind of out to lunch. Yeah, I'm not sure if there's, there's mind wandering or what they're thinking about. But yeah, they got a lot on their minds. Yeah. Um, and what we notice is that um, the neural activity at the baseline neural activity before the beginning of a new trial fluctuates in, in the lobus pallidus, uh, the output of the basal ganglia, and it correlates quite well with that. Okay. So, and, 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 it's, and it's not like post error slower or anything like that. It's like you're a little bit more aroused, a little bit less aroused. And we think that, that perhaps has to do with the basal ganglia's role in selecting different kinds of behavior. In, in our task, it's selecting whether he wants to continue doing the task or whether he just wants to sit again. Okay, I want to go back to food. And so I'm wondering whether that might be seen also in, that might also be responsible for things like, like the sort of attentional effects, which are going to call attentional effects, motivational effects. Maybe they're actually all kind of fluctuating together. And that actually we saw is about 20 trials. Okay. Yeah, I think I think that in our task, again, I, I have to go back and look at more detail. I think 20, it's unlikely that we see like really big trajectories 20 trials in a row, but you might be able
motivated or locked in or whatever it is that they're doing that makes them more likely to do so. Exactly, yeah, it's a similar kind of thing, and then they regressed out things like heart repetition to try to regress out the stimulus factors that we created. Yeah, I have a comment and a question. Uh, the, the comment is that uh, there was some time ago, Ritz Cadignon was uh, entertaining similar ideas regarding task switching. He basically said there is no task switching cost, it's just a mixture of two distributions. One distribution is where you're talking on task. That you do not lose any costs, and uh, another distribution where you are, well, whatever you would say, busy with other stuff. And he used this kind of mixed model approach to kind of uh, tease apart these two in individuals uh, so that you can get individual parameters that allow you to correlate them with, with others that it might be interesting to watch. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the question is that, I mean, this, this repulsion attraction story made sense to me. I just wonder how that goes beyond the autonomy. That, that is broadly discussed that there is, I don't know, you're familiar with this literature? Mm -hmm. So uh, and we know that in the Simon or the, the Stroop or the, uh, the, the Erickson Klein or whatever, uh, you, you can find that, uh, let's say, the, the uh, compatibility effect sizes are reduced after the trials mm -hmm. as compared to I think that was the same point that you find here. So that doesn't explain where the, 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 the let's say, the population comes from, but uh, I wouldn't go for another theoretic approach. I mean, they're formidic. Um, he said, however, you put that, but that is uh, related to effective cues or uh, tone down signals, whatever version of the story holds. But um, the, uh, I don't see why that is different. Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes, sometimes in the past, I've talked about this in terms of the salient object being stimulus conflict, not the, the no distracted trials. There's a lack of conflict. I do think that, at least in terms of data, one thing that this does, that, that as far as I know, most of those experiments don't do, is look at performance on a trial by trial basis. So we can we can call a trial with you know uh, an attraction versus a repulsion a different kind of behavioral response, even though the stimulus in both cases was identical. Whereas with the Newton effect, right, they'll, they'll call it a high conflict trial based on the stimulus, not based on the behavior. But I, I do think that, it, that there might be reasonable to, to connect it more to the where Trump cognitive control and conflict. Um, and I think in the past we've thought about that in those terms sometimes. I guess, you know, historically the, 